Good afternoon. I'm going to address this topic, patients with poor or good adherence, who will benefit more from long-acting therapy? I think we're all familiar with the promise of long-acting therapy. And for the next 15 minutes, we're going to think about which patient populations might derive the best benefit from it. Here are my required disclosures. So who do I think will benefit more from long-acting therapy? Patients with poor or good adherence? Well, I think the answer is all of the above. And I hope by the end of my talk, you'll understand why I think that. Why not simply ask all patients to take one pill once per day? We do have excellent co-formulated antiretroviral regimens now. Isn't that enough? Well, we certainly have good data that for many of our patients, that is not enough. And one of the best examples comes from the prevention arena. I'm going to share with you data from the IPREX study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine almost 10 years ago. That PrEP study, which involved co-formulated tenofovir and emtricitabine, looked at the potential benefit of daily one pill once per day interventions in reducing the acquisition of HIV in MSM and transgender women. And as you can see in these Kaplan-Meier plots, the one pill once per day intervention did in fact reduce the probability of developing HIV infection. But the benefit was only a 44% reduction in risk. Why was the benefit then so low? Well, there's good evidence presented in this figure that one of the main reasons for the low benefit of one pill once per day in this prevention study was the fact that the people who got infected, the cases in this figure, in fact, were not taking their pill every day because the concentrations of m triphosphate and tenofovir diphosphate, the intracellular active metabolites of these drugs were either undetectable or very low in the people who became infected. More recently, there's been a head-to-head -head study of one pill once per day PrEP with tenofovir and m as compared to long-acting injectable antiretroviral therapy. And that, of course, was the HPTN-083 study, whose final re primary results were presented by Rafi Landovitz at the virtual IAS meeting last July. This was a very large and important double-blinded, double-masked, prospective randomized trial in which MSM and transgender women at risk for HIV infection were randomized to either a, a four-week run-in of a five-week run-in, excuse me, of cabotegravir every day um, or cabotegravir placebo and then compared to uh, either tenofovir placebo with injectable uh, cabotegravir every uh, two months for approximately three years or uh, injectable cabotegravir placebo with tenofovir and FTC, uh, the, the actual drug. And the, at the end of that study, there was an assessment of the relative protection of each of those two regimens. Perhaps surprisingly, the long-acting regimen was substantially more effective than the daily oral PrEP. In fact, there were three times as many infections 
in patients who received the daily tenofovir m tricytabine as compared to patients who received the injectable cabotegravir. And um, because this was a double-blinded and double-masked study, this removed the potential bias of patients knowing which treatment they were receiving. And so therefore, for example, not taking uh, their daily pills because they thought they were receiving a placebo. The benefit of long-acting therapy as compared to the daily oral therapy extended throughout the up to three years follow-up of this study. And although it looks like there was perhaps a rise in benefit at the end of the study, this is probably just a reflection of the relatively low number of patients uh, who, were, uh, who were eligible for contributing endpoints at that, at that time during the study. Remember, this was a study that enrolled um, 4,500 patients who were randomized to either the long-acting therapy or the daily oral therapy. One reflection of the adequacy of blinding in the study was a comparison of prevalent and incident sexually transmitted infections. And what you can see in this table is that the uh, number of patients with syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia at baseline was nearly identical in the two groups. And during the study, the incidence of these same three sexually transmitted infections was also identical, suggesting that the blind was not broken and that risk behavior was not altered as a consequence of which arm the patient was randomized to. So in conclusion, both agents were highly effective for HIV prevention. The PrEP regimen containing long-acting cabotegravir, however, was superior to a daily oral regimen in this study with a 66% relative reduction in risk as compared to those receiving daily oral therapy. It's also important to keep in mind that this patient population was nearly identical to that in the IPREX study. And so this uh, benefit of injectable cabotegravir is especially impressive in that context. Cabotegravir long-acting was well tolerated despite injection site reactions. And peri-infection drug concentrations and a detailed resistance profile will be needed to fully understand and contextualize these results. And those uh, outcomes are expected to be presented uh, later. Cabotegravir then is the first long-acting injectable agent to demonstrate robust HIV prevention efficacy in men who have sex with men and transgender women at risk of HIV. There is an ongoing prevention study with a very similar design in cisgender women, HPTN084, and the results of that study are expected to be available within the next 12 months. There's some interesting implications for this study. One is that a single drug, cabotegravir, actually performed better in the prevention setting than two drugs, that is the co-formulated tenofovir and intricytabine. It's not entirely clear why the injectable regimen was so much better than the daily oral regimen. One possibility is the better pharmacokinetic profile over time of the injectable regimen as compared to the one pill once a day. But there are also potential consequences of non-adherence to daily oral PrEP as we saw in the IPREX study. The adherence uh, sub-study of, uh, of this particular trial uh, is still under analysis. It's also possible that this reflected the higher barrier to resistance of the integrase containing arm as compared to the daily oral arm. Or it could be something else that we haven't even thought about yet. 
suffice it to say, this is clear demonstration of the benefits of a long acting formulation as compared to standard one pill once per day antiretrovirals in the prevention setting. What about in the treatment setting? What if we compare long acting antiretroviral therapy to one pill once per day? Well, of course that was done in the ATLAS and FLARE studies, the two large randomized prospective phase three trials of injectable cabotegravir and rilpivirine as compared to daily oral therapy. And here are the designs of those studies. I think you all are aware that those studies showed non-inferiority of the injectable regimen as compared to continued daily oral therapy. It's important to point out, however, that it would be difficult to show that injectable long-acting therapy was better than daily oral therapy in this kind of a study because the participants were selected for suppressing their HIV and maintaining suppression while taking daily oral therapy. So presumably these were all highly adherent patients and not the poorly adherent patients we'd like to know more about. So long acting cabotegravir and long acting rilpivirine given every four weeks or every eight weeks were non-inferior to standard of care antiretroviral therapy in phase three clinical trials. There's equal benefit in treatment naive or treatment experienced participants in the ATLAS and FLARE studies, but both had to be suppressed on oral therapy before starting long acting injectables. The good news is that several studies are in progress right now examining the benefits of this two drug injectable long acting regimen in patients having difficulty maintaining suppression on standard one pill once per day regimens. And that includes the AIDS clinical trials group 5359 study, which is a randomized prospective study in patients with difficulty maintaining suppression on daily oral PrEP. And that study is currently underway and about 50% accrued. So I think we'll know soon from clinical trials about the magnitude of benefit of long acting injectable therapy like cabotegravir and rilpivirine in poorly adherent patients. But until then, I think we'll have to extrapolate from the results that were seen in the prevention setting in HPTN 083. I'd like to thank those who contributed to this presentation, particularly Marta Bofito from Chelsea and Westminster, and my colleagues at Johns Hopkins University uh, the, and the University of Liverpool, um, and my funding sources. And I would also like to recommend to all of you, if you wish to learn more about this, the LEAP website, Long Acting Extended Release Antiretroviral uh, Prevention uh, website, available at longactinghiv.org. Thank you.